All right, uh, we are uh, on the last chapter, and I think it's just uh, fitting that the last chapter is about the problems of calling out, to finding a stop, when to stop, when not to stop. And I hopefully after this chapter, you will agree with me that it's a super interesting topic, super relevant, especially for your guys' lives. And I will start with, uh, obviously, with Caesar, but we'll end with your graduation and what this um, research in this chapter has to tell you about your graduation. So I think normally kind of like in the ideal world, what happens is, right, we kind of, we cross the Rubicon, we set out, and then we achieve our outcome and everything, yay. So what happens actually when, psychologically, when we achieve our outcome? And the first, we get some kind of positive feedback, right? We get some feedback that our goal is achieved, yay. And then we feel maybe a burst of happiness and then the goal is kind of uh, sinks into um, like our pursuit, everything that's related to that um, sinks into a black hole. We forget about it. We actually suppress it. So there's like research by um, Saiganic, right? You might know her from uh, 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 memory, Saiganic effect, right? And here... What you can see in the Saganic effect, she always used this um, example of the waiter in uh, 1990 in the 1920s in Berlin, and so she's so impressed that basically this waiter he comes and he knows what everything everyone has on the table, right? He's like, I know this and that and so forth. So he knows he's like he has 10 tables or 15 tables, and he knows um, who has what to pay and what did they order and all of that, right? And so this is basically when our goals are open. When I want you, I've monitor you. you you need to pay, have an interest in knowing what you have to uh, pay me and what you order and so forth. And then she realizes, and then she can show that in your research, once the person paid, once the customer paid, then what happens in the waiter's memory is that everything related to that table, the faces, the... Um, the bill, what they ordered and so forth, is suppress the memory. This is now useless information. It has nothing to do with any of my other freaking goals. And hence it gets suppressed. So what you basically see that active goals are increased in their accessibility and inactive goals are decreased in their accessibility. So what happens is that when you achieve a goal, basically the signal to kind of move on to free your working memory, to free your resources, is that basically the achieved goal gets uh, forgotten. But sometimes obviously the goal to achieve the goal is not that clear okay it's unclear whether we actually for instance have a perfect piece of coursework that we should submit now or if we should work a little bit longer um, so sometimes the goals and as uh, achieving them are a little bit more fuzzy this is especially true for identity goals very tricky so identity goals could be something like i want to be a green person i want to be a good father i want to be a good scientist and so forth so they are very vague in some ways and achieving them it's unclear whether i actually possess these attributes um, and this brings us to one of my favorite um, theories uh, about the self-self completion theory by Wickland and Golwitz. so what they say is like that we have certain attributes are really central to us right you can think about a woman and this is uh, in a study but you can think about a young uh, student she's um, uh, uh, enraged by the unequal treatment that men and women get in her daily life and she's like yes I should be a feminist I want to be a feminist so now she's invited to do, come to a research study and what happens is that um, uh, some of her some students who are like her female students who are interested in being uh, feminists or who think it's, part, it's important to be a feminist they take a pseudo personality test and they learn that they're really good feminists. They have their traits and the behavior that shows they're really good uh, feminists. So they have a real positive um, feedback. In some ways, you can say they achieve their goal, right? And then the other half, they get like, you know what, your personality mm, doesn't fit so much with feminism. It seems like you're not a real feminist, not yet at least, okay? Negative feedback on a goal. So they haven't achieved their goal. And then after the experiment is done, in the original study, what they get is they're asked to take, um, uh, like, whether they want to have this magazine subscription uh, for a feminist magazine, right? And so here I put this, uh, nowadays there are no real magazine subscriptions. Maybe there are, I'm not sure. Uh, there might be. But you, for instance, could imagine that... Um, the experimenter offers you to purchase this wonderful book by Shimanda Ngozi Adichie, um, which 
you please read it's really good we should all be feminists right it's a clear sign okay only good feminists would read this book um so what happens is that those who uh, got positive feedback on being good feminists they did not show interest in subscribing to the feminist um uh, subscription because they already acquired kind of the identity goal they symbolically completed their identity goal they have been told that they are good feminists hence they don't have to pursue that goal anymore they're done with that they can turn to something else whereas those who have been told that they're not very good feminists according to this personality is they were much more likely to subscribe to this um uh, yeah subscribe to this magazine so you can think about many many goals right where we want to be we want to be fit we want to be good people we want to be uh anti-racism etc and often we just simply acquire symbolic acts to signal to others that we are that kind of person and that leads us to feel like we achieved the goal and hence we stop working on it so here's an kind of um a nice illustration of these ironic effects um, using the goal of being green. So very similar to the um, feminist study. So one group of participants who want to be green get told they're not really green. The other one gets told that they are green. And then they say like, okay, oh, it's a part about learning more about the um, personality of people of environment uh, environmentalists is now over we want to now have a put you into a second room with a second study about creativity in a study we give you some materials for um basically building a paper hat we want to see you that you can do a creative uh paper hat a paper hat that nobody ever saw beforehand and please um can you do this for 15 minutes and when you're done with that come over and show us your paper hat so they they work on it the hand uh, they get really crafty they cut they rip they do the things so um when they're done there's a lot of paper waste and now they come and tell the experimenter whether the that they're done right and now another experimenter checks whether they recycled or not so basically is this group who has been told no you're not a good environmentalist then go on to build a creative hat and then they're very likely to recycle right because they try to reacquire the goal of being green but those who have been told they're really really green already they then are less likely to recycle than those that um, have been told nothing or get the negative feedback. So positive feedback can really undermine in certain cases your goal pursuit, especially for identity goals, because what you want to is just acquire symbolic means in order to feel complete about your goal. Um, but there are other problems that you kind of might face, for instance, if you're a team leader, if you need to get feedback. Imagine you just started the project, you're 20% done, 80% needs to go, and you wonder, how can I motivate my team the best? Should I tell them that 20% is done or that we have 80% to go? You can think about like, oh, 20% done, that should motivate them because it kind of signals that we made a commitment, we're making progress. So things are moving in the right direction. So it but sh should basically motivate people by signaling goal commitment. Or you can say 80% to go. That signals there's a gap. We need to increase our actions so that we make progress. It's a different signal, but also something that should motivate you. So what works better? And this is a question that Ariel Fischbach uh, pursued. And what they find is that basically if you're on the left side of the Rubicon, then learning the 20 percent done increases your motivation because here you look for um commitment right you look for oh, are we really doing that as a team or am i really have to do that am i in uh, am i committed to this goal anything that you have in signals investment leads you to um, pursue your goal more whereas if you're already on the other side of the rubicon you don't care about you said yes i'm in i'm committed how much do we need to go oh 80 percent man i need to increase in order so that we all achieve our goal so here on the right side you want if where the committed people are you want um the focus on the progress that needs to be done okay so depending on which side of the rubicon you are feedback can affect you very differently 
let's finally talk about something that is often forgotten as like what if you don't achieve your goal imagine you're caesar you're surrounded by all these by ninjas by crazy people by super uh, buff uh, warriors and maybe you just lose uh, rome becomes unachievable and you kind of Uh, face negative feedback you face defeat what do you do so one of the problems is really like um, that a lot of people can't let go of their goal pursuit especially if they kind of invested a lot of um, resources already which is often called the sunk cost fallacy so the more you invested already in a goal pursuit the less likely you are to let go so you might have like more interest to let go because it's becoming increasingly expensive whether it's effort or money or time time to pursue this goal but you just can't because your commitment increases the more you invested effort and resources so now um, one really crucial thing is like yes how can i let go right you can think about so many um, cases of sunk cost fallacies where people kind of uh, made a right uh, made a wrong decision i'm sorry pursuing a goal that they can't achieve and the more they try uh, the less likely they are um, to let go so caesar might think like okay doesn't matter my whole army is almost about to die it doesn't matter we need to double our efforts we need to get more people and this time we will win and we will repeat and repeat the same thing so that's the sunk cost fallacy letting go is often very hard and it's especially hard if there's no kind of objective criteria to measure whether you should let go or not maybe you let uh, go too soon right so you can basically negotiate yourself always back into goal pursuit if you're motivated to do so There's a really wonderful paper by um, Klinger, Eric Klinger, 1975 in Psychological Review. It kind of looks a little bit what happens if there's a goal that is frustrated that I can't achieve. And he looks at it as a wonderful piece of writing. If you're interested in kind of everyday goal pursuit, how it relates to depression and a little bit more philosophical consideration, I cherish still the thought of reading it. Wonderful, really wonderful thing. And even though it's quite old, Sorry, even though it's quite old, um, 1975, um, it's still a wonderful, timely read. So what he basically does in some of his part of his analysis is to kind of look at how rats respond to frustrated goals. So let's think you're like you're pursuing the goal and you do it. And what happens is you kind of get reinforced. You're, you pursue something, but now you, um, you do something, you press a button and for instance, you don't get the sugar water that you're used to. Okay, now you, what rats do is they double their effort, they triple their effort, they even increase the effort much more. So they're uh, really, really kind of um, uh, pushing hard to uh, in a sense of frustration. And you can see that with humans too. So there's this phase which is kind of frustration to aggression. Imagine that as a simple metaphor, imagine you're standing in front of a door you're trying to get in and this is the door you always use to get for instance into uh, the gym or into a place you really want to get into but now it's closed so you kind of open and try and try again and then you're just like oh it's closed and you're just like i just have to do it harder i just need to push a little bit harder maybe if i drum against it maybe if i really really um intensely rattle the door then i get it open that's the phase he's talking about and that seems to be very common for people whose froze goals get frustrated okay then there's a little phase where you kind of like you basically fall down and reinvigorate your efforts a little bit you maybe stop you sit down you're like oh my god how will i go into this okay let me just try one more time uh but you still can't open the door this is what cat, cats rats do as well and then and this is so interesting comes this phase of depression um a phase of basically disengagement you feel low in your affect you stop being motivated you feel somewhat blue and this lets you to let go of your goal so klinger thinks so one of the really interesting considerations he has is like okay why is it that so many people have periods of depression There must be some kind of benefit to that, some evolutionary benefit. And his idea is basically that you need a phase of reduced um, sweetness, for lack of a better word, a reduced kind of a overall reduction, anything that is an incentive in your life in order to let go to a goal. So imagine that you kind of, you really, really want to get into that goal, uh, into that gym or into that door, whatever that door leads to. And now you can't. And he thinks you will experience kind of a phase of depression and sadness thereafter. To, and you need that to let go of that goal. 
Okay. So you kind of need, in a bigger sense, kind of like feeling uh, blue, feeling sad, feeling low on motivation, wanting to be on your own is a precursor, an important precursor to let goals go, to disengage and to re-engage into goal pursuit. Um, which kind of brings me to the last slide, and that's your graduation. I think often students expect that what happens after graduation, that there's like you have a month full of pleasure and fun and it's finally you can do all the things you always wanted to do but you felt like you couldn't but you still kind of did and they were so much fun and watching Netflix sleeping in and so forth and you expect that at least a lot of students and at least I did when I was a student that after graduation is like you're on a high for a month or something like that but often the opposite um, you can see students are quite for a bit kind of feeling low, low energy, not really interested in anything and so forth. And Klinger would say that this is kind of important because you're letting go of all the things that gave you energy. He said uh, this is a phase of kind of disengagement from everything that beforehand drove you, that incentivized you, that inner energized you. Um, that pulled or pushed you into certain directions. All of that is now gone. All the coursework, the deadlines, the submissions, the feedback, the meetings, etc. All of that is gone. And so this is why most of the students, at least that uh, from my own experience and the students I talk to, have a prolonged experience of somewhat low motivation. Uh, depression might be too strong, but somewhat like low affect, low interest, low motivation after they graduated. And this is part of transitioning into a new phase of your life.